Welcome to the Drawing Board. The financial crisis has left in its wake a wave of foreclosures. We've seen more than 300,000 foreclosures a month now for the past 17 months. Obviously, foreclosure is a terrible outcome for anyone who loses a home. It's also bad for banks and lenders because if people can't afford to make the payments on their homes, banks and lenders lose money. But the problems don't end there. A foreclosed home sets off a domino effect that causes a lot of other bad things to happen to all sorts of people who aren't directly connected to a home's foreclosure. Let's take a look at just how far the ripples of a foreclosed home can reach and what ideas some folks who study foreclosures are proposing to stop the rising tide. The first thing we have to recognize is that foreclosures are a bigger problem in a weak economy. In a healthy economy, a foreclosure is still a bad thing, but there's a process for recouping some of the losses. If, say, Bob and Lisa here can't afford to pay their home any longer, and the bank takes possession of it, the bank can sell the house to someone else looking to buy a home because a lot of people are in good financial situations and they're confident of their futures, so there's likely to be a lot of potential buyers. It's not the ideal situation. The bank would rather have Bob and Lisa go on making payments, and the bank may even lose some money finding another buyer, but the ill effects are somewhat contained. Not so in our current economy. Today, when a bank or lender takes ownership of a foreclosed home, there's less of a chance someone will end up buying that home. Why? Well, first of all, unemployment is high. Some people have taken pay cuts at work because business is down. Others are nervous about their futures and they've tightened their purse strings. Sometimes foreclosed homes are in areas of the country where the population is dwindling and there just aren't enough people to buy up all of the homes that have been foreclosed. A lot of reasons why demand for houses is down. And this leads to some widespread negative consequences, especially when so many foreclosed homes are on the market. Imagine there's this neighborhood. And let's say in this neighborhood, this house goes into foreclosure, and then this house, and then that house. Now let's say because of the economy, banks or lenders can't find people who either want to buy these homes or who can afford to buy them, and the homes sit vacant for a while. And then a while longer. Weeds start to overtake the yards. The houses fall into disrepair. Vacant homes tend to invite crime. Property values in the neighborhoods decline because fewer people want to live there now. And now, since there's no one in the homes paying taxes, the city's income tax goes down, so the city starts to have budget problems and maybe it has to cut jobs in the fire or police departments or in the schools and libraries or in other social services. Now the neighborhood becomes even less attractive. Property values fall further and the people who still live in the neighborhood who are dealing with vacant or abandoned properties and fewer social services, well, they want to get out. It's a vicious downward spiral. Now imagine this isn't happening in just one neighborhood, but a whole bunch. That's a situation we find ourselves in today. So how do we get out? Or how do we at least do a better job of preventing foreclosures and working through them more efficiently so foreclosed properties are quickly turned around again and put to good use and so neighborhoods aren't left in disarray for long periods of time. Some researchers within the Federal Reserve System have been working with others studying the foreclosure problem, and the ideas have been collected and published in a paper that you can see by visiting the URL you see here on your screen. Let's highlight a few ideas. One is to use land banks in new ways. When land banks began around 40 years ago, they were operated by local governments that would use money from their budgets to buy and hold large amounts of foreclosed and abandoned properties from the property owners so the properties or the land they sat on could eventually be used for things like retail or commercial development projects or city parks or whatever the city thought would benefit the community. There are a number of obstacles to municipal land banks, however. First, governments have to use money from their budgets to pay for the properties and that can get expensive. Plus, it's often hard to find funding. Also, municipalities can only buy properties in their jurisdictions, which means that any properties outside of their borders, well, they're off limits. And that makes it difficult to have a regional approach to addressing foreclosures. 
It also puts municipalities at a disadvantage over private investors who can buy a bunch of foreclosed properties in a region across city borders all at once. Here's how that works. Say you're a property owner who wants to get rid of a bunch of foreclosed homes, and the homes are scattered across a region. If you had a choice between selling the entire stock to a single private investor who could buy all of the properties you have in the region at once, or selling the properties that fall within the border of a city to the city and then having to go out and look for a second investor to buy the ones that are outside the city limits, well, what would you choose? So you can see some of the drawbacks to traditional land banks, but modern land banks are a little different. First, they're often run as a standalone, nonprofit corporation, and that has a number of advantages. The most obvious is they're not limited to operating only within municipal borders. They can operate regionally and look for solutions that address an entire region and not just a city within that region. Modern land banks are also funded differently. They don't rely on government money. The people running them can raise money through private investors or by collecting fees from penalties people pay for unpaid property taxes or a number of other ways. So the funding can be creative and the perspective can be wide, which means the land bank can now compete better with private investors. And what's the advantage of a land bank buying the property instead of a private investor? Well, private investors often buy a bunch of properties and then hold on to them for long periods of time, hoping the economy will improve down the road and that they'll be able to sell their properties for more money at some point in the future. Nothing wrong with that as far as investments go, but it often means the properties sit idle for a long time. And when vacant or abandoned properties sit for a long time, it only exacerbates the problems associated with foreclosures that we talked about earlier. Land banks, on the other hand, are motivated to make the properties and the land they acquire useful again as quickly as possible. And that can be beneficial to neighborhoods and cities and entire regions, even the entire economy. Another idea to help prevent houses from becoming vacant and depressing neighborhoods is for nonprofit organizations to buy the properties and then to rent them to the very people who had purchased the home. In some cases, people can give up ownership of their home but stay in the home as renters. And in cases where the original homeowner can't afford the rent, the nonprofit can look to rent to other qualified people. Some other ideas in the Federal Reserve paper include improving conditions in neighborhoods by changing the economics of owning a foreclosed property. Now that means ramping up code enforcement and fining property owners that don't maintain their properties. And what's typical is that owners who are fined for code violations have more incentive to keep their properties from falling into disrepair, and that can keep blight from settling in the neighborhoods. There have also been some experiments allowing people who own and occupy a property that's about to go into foreclosure or a publicly funded housing program first rights to buy the property. Now, typically they're given about 15 days to buy the property before it goes on the general market. The idea here is to give people who would seem to have the most vested interest in maintaining the property and the neighborhoods an opportunity to acquire the property first. Now there are plenty more ideas in the paper, but for now, something to think about until the next time on the drawing board.